infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smelter. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Network. My name is Chad Smeltzer. I am your host. Today's guest is Kevin Lyons, who's the CEO of Flashvote. Thanks for joining me, Kevin. Hey, nice to, nice to be on your show. We finally, to talk uh, you. we finally get to meet and uh, have a con conversation uh, virtually. Uh, we talked on the phone briefly, but uh, I want to talk about your experience, Kevin. And uh, you started in you went to school for chemical engineering and now you're a CEO of Flashvote. So let's start where that all kind of worked out, uh, you know, I mean, chemical well, engineering. You don't, you don't see the obvious path from chemical <laughs> engineering to local government? <laughs> no, do you so not see this? There is one, actually. It's, it's usually okay. like public works and waste treatment, you know, water, stuff like sure. that. I've toured many, many a uh, waste treatment plant in my day. But yeah, uh, yeah I, was, I was actually a chemical engineer undergrad in the East and then uh, got recruited out of some grad programs in California. And uh, they were nice. California is a nice place. Yeah. You know, Massachusetts is nice too. California is nicer in some ways. And yeah. uh, so I ended up out there doing a chemical engineering PhD program, doing some chemical physics experiments, um, which okay. again is clearly laying the path to local government. So no, what actually happened is, uh, so my, my second year there after, you know, I'm in the lab and uh, setting up these experiments, they take about five hours each to just, I just sit there and let this ultra high vacuum thing just heat up and then, you know, get ready. So I started reading books really for the first time, <laughs> you know. Because you had a lot of time in your hands, it sounded like. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like, what am I going to do? I can't do anything while I, you know, so I decided to, you know, read books instead of math. And that's, uh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. I recommend it to people. Uh, so I, I actually got really interested in um, uh, people versus molecules at that point. Started reading sort of some classics in um, you know human behavior, back to Adam Smith, yeah. uh, even some you know back to the Greeks, and then moved forward. Was kind of like, wow, this is you know kind of cool because you can talk to people. You can't talk to molecules and ask them what they're doing. They're really hard to track and find, and you know. And yeah. uh, kind of like people too. So I uh, decided I felt, it was a hard choice, but I was like, man, I think I need to switch, you know, from, from studying molecules to studying people. And so I was really? fortunate enough to get admitted to a program at Berkeley. It's about a four person a year, little program, business and public policy, PhD. Huh. And the guy running it was a, actually a chemical engineer as an undergrad. Um, and he was turned economist. And I never didn't know anything about him other than he called me and said, Hey, you got admitted, you know, come meet me for lunch, you know, give you the, the little tour. And it turns out his, his name was Oliver Williamson. He's an awesome guy. And uh, he ended up winning the Nobel prize in economics for governance wow. in 2009, along with Eleanor Ostrom, who may, is a name who might be more familiar to people in local government. But uh, okay. yeah, so I basically had the dumb luck to get, you know, connected with him back in the early nineties. And that set, you know, set the path for, really trying to become you know, world's expert in local government, basically. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, impressive. I mean, molecules of human beings and psychology yeah. and then the psychology of my molecules. Do they even have psychology and molecules? Yeah. You know, I don't no, know. No, but they, but they yeah. do things together. So what's really cool about them is really? like, you know how like ice freezes and water freezes, right? Yeah. So at some point, all these molecules, water molecules just kind of hang out. And then they get to this point where like, hey, let's all just start to boop, boop. And all of a sudden they're solid from a liquid, huh. right? So phase transitions is what I was looking at. Like picture a, a layer of molecules coming down on a surface of something like yeah. a table or a piece of metal or a catalytic converter actually, right? And then yeah. at some point they, they're they kind of at, you know bouncing around then they start to form like maybe make a checkerboard and then they change, you know, so crystals, all that stuff, super interesting if you're yeah. you know, into that. And, and I was like, you know what? Complex behavior from basic simple rules of molecules and it turns out like, there's a ways that uh, you can model large scale human institutions that way as well. And so that turned out to be the connection. That was where, at least that's the weird way that my brain was wired to make that transfer. Uh, right. Wow. That's really cool because, you, well, you're talking about how they co collect and gather like a community, right? We're talking about now exactly. we're talking about government or communities, same thing, people, you know, communities and attract each they other. Interact. And, uh, they right. interact. And then you That's get things exactly like, what we do. You get, 
you get you get things like a like a golf club or a, a book club <laughs> or a, or a price or right. a rule, right? Or a norm, right. a thing that everyone's doing, or you know all these things, culture, right? And so that's yeah. that's the connection, and and understand how you get good rules and bad rules, and and you know how they form, how they break down. So ultimately, just success modes and failure modes for local government um, and communities in general, more broadly. Wow. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, connection there. Uh, wow, I've never uh, thought of it that way. So, uh, when did the entrepreneur spirit start with you? Uh, you know, after you started understanding yeah. humans. <laughs> well, so uh, so my my first PhD advisor, is this guy who he, he showed up at Caltech and had tenure in two and a half years, like that's smart. Like he's one of the smartest people ever. Like there's way more Nobel Prize winners than people that have done that at Caltech, for example. Okay. So he ends up getting recruited out of his job where he was out earning the chancellor by like a hundred thousand dollars a year. Cause he had so much research budget into a startup in Silicon Valley. And the startup was looking at uh, new materials. So how do we find new materials that are stronger, better, more magnetic, whatever it is, like all these, all these properties. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I get a call while I'm in year two of my program at Berkeley and they're like, Hey, uh, just, you know, just doing this startup thing. You want to come check it out. And so I basically got recruited back to my old PhD advisor, who is now the CTO of this company and okay. into the startup world. And, you know, I met with him and he said, Hey, you know, give me that very serious look. He's like, you know, if I'd known about this startup thing, uh, I wouldn't have stayed in academics, you know? Like, wow. <laughs> right. Because you are Mr. Academic, like this, there's no one, you know, who was more all in. And uh, so I gave it a shot, actually. So he recruited me and I took a three year leave to work on that. And it was really, really powerful stuff because instead of just writing about stuff or you know doing research and putting it out there and hoping that someone maybe finds it useful. Right. You're actually doing things with real people, with real customers. We're working with like, you know, GE and Osram and all these big companies, I mean, Dow, you know, uh, massive chemical companies doing research for them and making products better that you then see in the real world. You know, like x-ray, yeah. you know, those digital x-ray machines, like for your dental oh, yeah. thing. Yep. So the better the little phosphor, the, the absorber of the energy, yeah. the less energy you need to shoot through your face. And so like, that's one of the projects that we worked on to make a wow. more efficient thing. Blue LEDs. You remember those? Yeah. Blue LEDs. You put a little, little converter mm-hmm. from uh, blue to, to orange on there, and then you get a white light. So w- white LEDs I worked on 20 years ago. I mean, it was incredible. Wow. Like, way ahead of the curve. So, yeah, now yeah so that was good. Everything. So that was tempting and I did it. <laughs> yeah. Right. The other thing is it yeah. was like blind search through the periodic table, which was okay. how I was, what I was studying at the time was how do you actually model, you know, uh, choice or decision making under ignorance when you don't know what you're doing. Right. And so uh, that was what we were doing on a very large scale. We were doing a thousand times as fast, doing a thousand experiments at a time instead of one, basically. At a wow. Time. So that's really it, it kind of fit. It made sense at the time. It does. Yeah. Periodic table has been around for a long time. Um, What do you now? I'm curious. The periodic table, you know, what is your what are your thought process on? Is this how we do science? Is that how we use? Is it just do people still use it? Yeah, well, the periodic table, absolutely, because it's a way, it's a model. It's a, it's a simplified model of organizing yeah. how these, you know, how individual atoms will actually interact with each other in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. And so if you're saying, hey, I want to I wanna make um, something that looks like this other thing. Well, so you might say, well, gee, there's a, you know, it's got a rubidium or platinum or iridium in it. So let's try some of those neighbors instead. What happens if we swap in, you know, a slightly bigger atom? Does it change the magnetic characteristics or the electrical characteristics? You know, this is a time when people are looking for like room temperature superconductors. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. The, basically, no, no, no electrical loss. It just blasts right through. And so, yeah, you just start just swapping in modern. different uh, yeah. elements. Yeah. And you can just yeah. you know, see if you make something better. Yeah, that's what do you think is going to I'm, I'm probably off topic, but let's go with it. Yeah, AI, whatever topic, relevant. whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, no, AI is, rel- you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this yeah, in the AI. periodic table. You're talking about molecules. You're talking about AI now. And that's why I was questioning, like, does anybody still use it? Because I'm assuming that a lot of it's being driven by computers now where it's all automatically coming out with like, uh, you know, you put in your input and then you get the output, you know, from the computer. So I was just curious on what yeah. that looks like. 
Well, that's that's a really uh, that's a really uh, deep question. It turns out because the in the argument against what we were doing, people would say, "Oh, you're just doing you're a monkey. You're doing blind search for the periodic table." Well, no, we're not actually. We're applying both. Yeah. So we're applying the best model we have for you know if we make say like take where you take a bigger atom. This is we expect it to do blank, right? Yeah. Or a smaller atom, we expect it to do blank, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So we know maybe directionally it might get better in some way. So you actually, but there's still so many combinations and so many ratios, you know, 10%, 90, 20%, 80, whatever you want to do. And yeah. so by the time you, you know, you look at this, even if you narrow it down really well with a good model or the best, uh, you know, digital model you have from AI, which mm -hmm. at the time, you know, people were using for like protein folding and other stuff, which is still, yeah. still a popular thing. You still got a ton of experiments left to do. You still got to figure yeah. out what the real world says, or as as I like to say, you know, it's a it's a Swiss Army proverb: when the terrain and the map disagree, trust the terrain, right? So you got to do the experiment, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, yeah. My advisor it's, used it's, to say we'd be like arguing. Well, you know, what do you think it's going to do? Well, I think it's going to do this. So I think it's going to this, and he just like walk in on our conversation. Like, Why don't you guys just shut the hell up and do the experiment? It's the only like, way you're going to know. That's it. Like, you, it. You, no one's <laughs> going to win. No one knows until you actually do it in the real world. And right. I mean, that's a mindset that's actually really helpful too. Especially that's a good transition in this our startup conversation. Same thing. Mm -hmm. You start something, you develop a you know a business model. You're like, this is what it's going to work. But are people <laughs> going to buy it? You know, are people going to buy it? That's what I've been told my whole life. Or, you know, sell something people are going to buy. You know, that they want that's right versus. Make Very something similar. people want. That's right. Make and something uh, want. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with like your experiments. And then, you know, how does that, you know, did it work? You know, does did it work? Does it work? And, you know, the, where does it go from there right? after it does work? Do you en enhance it more? Is that, I'd imagine that's the scientific side of it, right? It's just how do we make it better, right? Okay. Do this. Yeah. Now, how do we make it better, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and to your earlier question, what do we learn? Right. Did we learn yeah. another another maybe modeling trick where we learned, oh, you know, if we do this, it does this. So if we do more of this, maybe we can actually. Right. So it's yeah. it's just a continuous, you know, continuous explanation uh, building, you know, better understanding, better explanations. That's what science really is. And very similar to entrepreneurship, but different. I mean, it's science and entrepreneur, but you think about it, you keep testing, like pivoting. You got to pivot your business. You got to do these things. Yeah. You have all these processes, right? And you got to make sure they all work or the business falls apart, right? It's it's similar in a kind of way. It's 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 interesting. It's right? the same process. And this is what yeah. was funny. This is my my advisor, uh, the old PhD advisor. He was like, you know, he's, he was hooked. He got hooked because yeah. we're basically, you know, trying to do things that matter a lot more actually in terms right. of you know impact so applying the same methodology and the same rigor um uh, to 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 solving a problem but doing it where it's like okay now we're playing with real chips essentially right like yeah this is real yeah. real people there's a lot of people's money a lot of money an important problem and actually as the founder of the company who, who was an amazing human being also he founded like 10 billion dollar companies if you can imagine wow. that he, uh, you know, he was like, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to go find the five best people on earth to work on this problem. And we're going to give them a lot of money and they're going to fail, 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 fail until they succeed. True. And, and that's, that's a startup too, right? You just got to <laughs> keep iterating, is. fail, 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 fail long enough to preserve, persevere and succeed. Yeah, it is. It's, it's exactly the same. I mean, you, you fail, then you learn and you fail and you learn and mm -hmm. you fail, and you succeed. And then you get to that point where, okay, am I comfortable then? That's the entrepreneur spot. It's like, do I get comfortable or do I keep going? You know, where does never, that never get that? comfortable? Yeah. That's I'm with you. I agree with you hundred percent, but <laughs> there is that time where you're like, man, do I still want to ride this roller coaster? And that's yeah. like entrepreneurism. Entrepreneurship is, you know, it's just a roller coaster. It's a, un up and down and you're talking about humans it's us interacting with our humans our employees our customers our just everyone in our environments right so very yeah. interesting um path you you took uh <laughs> very yeah cool. that's the simplified version but uh yeah that's, <laughs> no that's that i mean it's great experience right uh, so having had kind of the you know world-class academic experience um and then world-class startup experience and yeah. uh and then, you know, go out and do my first startup on my own. And of course, it's it's not world class. It's terrible, right? It's by by comparison, it's it's bad on all fronts. This was like the early late nineties. 
Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, that's when I, you learned because now you're the one responsible for everything, right? You're not just second yeah. guessing. You're not just, you know, thinking, oh, this would be great if we did this. Would it? Like, yeah. you know, again, do people actually want this? Will they buy it now? Yeah. All these it's, things that start to matter. You, you just, there's nothing like honing your decision process when everything's on the line, too. So, yeah. uh, you, you get really so good true. at, you know, thinking through, am I deceiving myself? Am I happy ears? You know, it's just, hey, am I, am I hearing what I want to hear? Or is there actually still a problem here? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Being able to watch your blind spot, self-evaluate, you know, figure out, because, it. It, you know, if you're a CEO of a company, it's hard to juggle all these things and, you know, manage everything if you don't have the right process or people in place. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So that's what, uh, what I've learned is you got to have the right people really comes down to the right people and then the workflows, <laughs> you know, what's the workflow? Like, you know, can you grow yeah. it? Can you not, you know, how's it scale? You know, all these things. So. Well, there, there's that saying uh, also early on, right. It's like, uh, people are, people are super important, but, yeah. uh, good people, bad market, market wins. Right? Oh. I think that's maybe, maybe an interesting saying. All the time. But, yeah, so you got to be solving an actual problem that people have that's important to them, and yeah. that they want to see solved. You know, it's got to be a pain, not a vitamin. You know, painkiller, not a vitamin. Right. And and uh, you know, ideally, like I'm also not a fan of selling candy. You know, things that you might want to buy, but you probably shouldn't. They're not actually solving your problem, or they're creating other. They're problems. bad for your teeth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's you can candy, vitamin or painkiller. You know, that's that's basically <laughs> where are you? What are you actually selling? And, and yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah, very good point. So, leads us into flash vote. Yeah. yeah. Where did where did that come from? Obviously, out of the entrepreneurship, but uh, where did the idea come from? How did you decide that that was your entrepreneur path of like curing that problem? Well, so when I uh, when I left the chemical engineering program, you know, I, at first, as I say, like the first grad student at grad school experience, like I'm I'm there to get a job, basically. Right? Mm -hmm. And my second one was actually there to get a bunch of answers, you know, so I was fully self-driven at that point. Like, you know, what, 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 think of it this way. Like you see someone on one side of an issue saying something, you see someone on the other side of an issue saying something. And as, as, as train with the training as a scientist that I was lucky to have, it's kind of like, well, again, like, why don't you guys just run the freaking experiment? You know, yeah. <laughs> what, who's right? Like, I don't care. You guys are just, like, you're just noise. Like, just figure out who's right. Thing. Isn't yeah. there a right answer? <laughs> Right? right. So I basically went into this this uh, other program like, well, why don't we just figure out the right answer? You know, and it turns out there, there there was a lot of work that had been done to figure out, yeah, this is the right answer. This is a wrong answer. This is a right answer. This is a wrong answer. And this is why and why this is why. Right. So all the way down. And um, so that was really interesting. Then I got then I was hooked. And, and then you go, well, wow. So but if this is the right answer, why are people doing this instead, which is yeah. the wrong answer? And then you get into like actual the dynamics of organization and, you know, how do you how do you actually get a group of people to do something that's not in their interest? Right. Versus something that is. And then there's these collective dynamics. Um, you probably heard of like a prisoner's dilemma where you have these two prisoners that have been arrested. And if neither one of them talks, they both go free. Right. Yeah. But if either one of them talks, the guy that talks gets a better deal. The guy that doesn't gets the full mega sentence, right? Yeah. Okay. And of course, yeah. if they both talk, they're both screwed. And so that's a classic <laughs> example of where, yeah, obviously you can see it's in there as well. Geez, why don't they just not both talk? Well, because they don't know that the other person is going to talk. So how do you get yeah. some kind of institution where they can, you know, credibly commit themselves to not topics so that they end up with the great thing? And this, this, you know, has applications to thing. Tragedy of the Commons is another classic people so, well i'm just going to put my i'm going to add my sheep to the grazing field just my one sheep yeah. no biggie everyone does that together all of a sudden the grass dies and the field's dead you know and this or in the first case they're both in jail maybe that's a good thing by the way for society to have structures like that in some case and not in the second case yeah so yeah so so getting into all that and understanding not just you know oh well this is a mistake well yeah but why is that mistake it's not just well we shouldn't be doing that well no but we are so why are we doing that because you, unless you solve the why we're do, making the mistake right now, saying that it's a mistake or saying we should change it is worthless. So right. ultimately, that um, that led to a, a kind of interesting conclusion, which is, uh, which I've been sharing with a lot of city managers. You know, just get their take, and they go, "Yeah, that's completely right." So everything in local government is basically a solved problem, right? This is yeah, that's an aggressive statement. 
but it's plausible at least. And I, you know, I can actually point you to things where like, yeah, this has been solved. Something, anything anyone's ever seen has been solved somewhere. But here's what's not solved. How do you go from where you are right now, politically, right, with all the interest groups in your community or whatever it is, or your mm-hmm. country in a bigger sense, to mm-hmm. the right answer, to something that actually makes everyone better off? How do you make that leap? How do you make that change? And that's mm-hmm. actually where um, you know, Flashvote and other tools come in because a lot of times you have a noisy group that's essentially holding a community hostage, you know, by dominating the public meetings, bullying, influencing, right? That's like social media. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's the problem with social you media go. now. <laughs> yeah, basically, you've given I've, heard, I've had people. They, yeah, they say, "Hey, I uh, I wish we never created this platform for you know the crazy people in my community." <laughs> Yeah, it's it makes things more dramatic, more drama, yeah. more mental health. Like there's all kinds of oh. consequences, but there's there's also positivity to it too. You get more you know, people in a community. You know, as we just talked about at the beginning, like bringing people more together. But that can have effects. You know, it, that we, it, it you really know, does. And, and uh, <laughs> like we're having it where I live now. There's this crazy thing going on. Um, people are some some people, right? Oh, everyone's talking about this. Are they? Is it everyone? You know, that's ultimately we're able to say no. Actually, no. It's ten people. <laughs> Not, you, know, you know those ten right. people who dominated that last meeting. It's just them. <laughs> yeah. Without it's that, they, you group. don't know. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. It's just it's it's actually no. It's you know it's Bob and his five friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they're super active on social media, so everyone's like, "Gee, I guess this is what everyone thinks." That's yeah. how we're wired. You know, that's, yeah. we're wired to overreact to what we see in front of us relative to you know something else we might might know or have yeah. a really good reason to believe. And uh, you know, I, we're all susceptible. If, so it's interesting. What, me. Yeah, what you said at the beginning, uh, like when I asked you about what flash flash vote is, you said about you know two prisoners and one talks then you know, they, one gets a benefit, one doesn't, you know, that, that, so is that how flash vote kind of, you know, operates? It's, it, you know, I know you're probably going to get into it, but just curious on that yeah. kind of, if two people don't connect and their votes are, are different and they don't know about it, that's important, right? That's the way we want to keep it. It is important. That's, that's a really, really subtle observation, but yeah, there's a lot of science in how you design, how you get your input. And so yeah. where social media fails is, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a small number of people who are loud and are kind yeah. of, you know, are willing to be loud. And if you always think about like, are the, you think about it in your life in general, you know, are the smartest people, the loudest people, or are they generally the quietest people? Right. That's, and I think that's we all interesting. Yeah. Think and we go, huh, oh, wait a minute. Person in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so there's like an inverse, you know, which means it's going the wrong way. It would be awesome if if the smartest people were the loudest people. That'd be great because then we can just, you know, oh, there's more noise. Great. So there's actually this crazy curve called the Dunning-Kruger effect where smarter people are actually, they they know they're not that smart. They actually know what they don't know. And then as you go backwards down, it turns out these psychologists measured this. And as you get to this, you get to this range where people start to think they're super smart and they're really super dumb. Yeah about things. Hmm. And it's, you could kind of see effects like that in social media, unfortunately. Oh, you know, yeah. We're like the loudest people say the dumbest stuff on social media. I'll, I'll just say that. I don't think that's controversial, but that's also, of course, once you go to a clickbait media. So if I interview 10 normal people and one crazy person and the 10 normal people <laughs> say something completely innocuous about, you know, pick, pick a topic, right? biology, climate change, vaccines, it doesn't matter. Whatever they say that's completely normal, that everyone actually is like, yeah, that's totally true. If you get one crazy person, in the old days, they wouldn't report it because that would kind of be like, well, you know, our readers are going to think we're weird if we say that, Um, unless it's a really big deal. And nowadays for clickbait, they have to report it because that's how you get the, the outrage, the emotions that force you to click. And so the more you see that, you start to think, gosh, I guess everyone's crazy. And this is a real effect. It's, it's a problem for us right now. You know, yeah. and, and the, media, the media landscape has changed how our brains think about what's going on out there. Yeah, it could be super manipulating. I mean, really, really, that's right. it is. It is now. That's what's happening, right? So so yeah. uh, with all these that's factors. That's why people do it. With all these fa- yeah. yeah, I mean, with all these factors going on, Kevin, how... How do we, you know, we're talking about voting, but how do, how do we make voting more efficient and like more 
progressive, like more digitized, you know, more digital transformation? Um, Is it possible than, than still mailing in our votes? Like all these things that are going on. Just curious. Well, so, I mean, voting, uh, voting in a lot of ways is, is kind of a tiny overrated piece of the big puzzle. And, yeah. um, it's really the, the data that helps the public servants serve the public. Let's put it yeah. that way. Serve the public as a whole. Right. So when you become, you know, an, an official, I've been one for nine years now, a uh, public official on our County advisory board, okay. you get, you know, you get bombarded by stuff from people. And, um, yeah. you know, that's what we call engagement, by the way, engagement is hearing from people interested in a topic. It's actually not helpful usually because they're trying to sway you or manipulate you or something. It's very rare. They're like, Hey, I have this really yeah. good idea you didn't have, or, Hey, here's a fact I just wanted to share with you that you probably didn't know. Or here's a question you might want to ask, you know, because this will help you do your job better. That stuff's super helpful. That's, that's the theory mm -hmm. of like, you know, getting input from anyone. Uh, what's not helpful is like, hey, there's 10 of us here and nine of us are against this because our brains will use that sometimes. And that's just garbage. It's, in fact, our data shows that's usually the opposite of what the community wants. You know, about 70 percent of the time, it. what you hear, that sentiment from that small group is the opposite of what your whole community wants. And so, um, you know, I think we, we created flash votes so that you could actually have data on what the whole community wants. The whole, you know, a representative mm. sample of regular people that you can go out to whenever you need it, whenever you need the data, uh, especially if there's some noisy groups in town, which could be the tip of the iceberg, or they could be the opposite outlier, like we were just talking about. But you don't know unless you have that bigger, broader picture. And so once you have yeah. that, then you can actually be a good public servant. And you can you know, understand what the real priorities are of the community, not just what these five people are agitating about, you know, trying to make the most important thing in your yeah. community. Yeah, that's that, now I'm now I, I'm getting it now. I didn't really know what flash vote was until now, like you and I talking now, it makes a lot of sense because you need councils just need a better gauge on what's going on in their communities. And I think that's where mm -hmm. you're talking about making a huge difference with flash vote, right? It's it's knowing what the constituents want versus yep. what the, the leaders actually want. And then that that will ultimately help them, right? I mean, you're you're engaging your constituents, right? You're, you're understanding more about them because you're providing that information, right? On flash vote. And they're, yeah. they're getting more data really about what the constituents want well, versus them making I mean, a judge, judgmental opinion. Uh, go ahead. Or like you said, doing what they want to do. Right. They're, and you know, it's, it's a cheat code for reelection. If you actually do your job. Yeah. yeah it turns out people will appreciate that. And when you do those things that the noisy few want you to do, well, you're actually pissing off your whole community and you don't know it. And, you know, people yeah. will get removed from office for, for doing stuff like that eventually. Um, but mm. yeah, I mean, the bigger challenge is how do you, how do you tighten that link? So it's funny, you use the word leaders, right? When, and journalists use it all the time, but we don't actually elect leaders. We elect servants and we select mm. people. They, they're in the top of the org chart and then they, they win their election and they go down a box, you know, congratulations. You competed yeah. for a demotion and you won. And there's a lot of honor in that role, right? This is a very important role, but you're not a leader, yeah. right? Of, of the community, you're you, you're now part of the leaders of the government organization. But there's a that's, lot of confusion uh, about that, and that's what leads to that like mayoritis ego problem sometimes, um, where people think, oh, "Well, yeah. I got elected to do what I want to do." No, you didn't. You got elected to serve the public as a whole, and it doesn't matter who voted for you or how you got the job. By the way, you could have been appointed. You could have run unopposed. You could have run against an idiot. Like it doesn't matter. Like none of that matters. You have the job now. And that's the transition from campaigning to governing. That's really challenging for, for people too. Cause um, you know, they, they don't know the difference. Then why would they until they, you know, actually learn it. That, yeah, that is huge, Kevin. I mean, you're talking about, I've, I've said this before where leaders don't know what they're getting in to really no. until they get elected. And then it's like a shock. You know, they become a mayor of a massive city. And I'll use Chicago, for example. You know, you're electing people within the community that have no idea how to run businesses, never had that experience, never had those things in life that it really does take when you're in a government, let's say a mayor position, right? You're running a business. It's a not not really, but you're serving your constituents are your customers, first of all, that we don't I don't 
like you said, they don't really get that because it becomes a power thing, right? Uh, and then they, you have to run it like a business though. You really have to take the taxpayer budget dollars and use them wisely and not waste them is what I would hope that is the goal, yeah, well, but does that really happen? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, no, it's great. So like a business is another one of those phrases that's really common and um, it kind of makes sense depending on how you're going to use it. But it turns out that like yeah. things that are common in business, like, you, you know, like tipping a waiter, for example, or whatever, that's now a bribe in government. Now that's weird. Why is that? Right. Or all these things that, you know, yeah. associate with a business, um, uh, making, making a profit, like actually, you know, the margin between your cost of providing the service and the value of the service that you're able to charge. Uh, you know, that's illegal in government. You have to charge the cost. It's a cost plus, not even a plus kind of contract. So it, the actual thing is a government is a trust. So a bunch of people get together, pool some resources. So they put in some money, they might own some property in common, and uh, even on some behaviors, they might all agree, we'll all agree to put our trash out at the same day, at the same time. Before I could put my right. trash out anywhere or take it anywhere. Now we're going to, we're all going to contribute those to a common pool. And then we're going to manage those as a common trust for a common benefit, right? This is how you get around some of these problems, these, these coordination problems we were talking about earlier. Um, but now yeah. you have to assign people to manage that and then you have to supervise them. And that's why, you know, the, the large group of people now has to assign a group of people to be their representatives, to act as the public. So that's how we get the elected officials. And now they have to supervise the people that they further delegate responsibility for, you know, a, like a city manager or administrator, uh, and then the staff mm -hmm. under that, right? And then you have this whole thing that's basically the whole point of this is to create some public value with some public resources. And um, that's, you know, the trust is a really high standard of a duty, a fiduciary duty to those, mm -hmm. to those people who have contributed and to the beneficiaries. Right. And so there's a lot of, um, a lot of good instincts we actually have from, from life that apply. Like if 10,000 people all pitch in five bucks to buy pizza and now your job is to get the pizza, um, are you allowed to order the pizza you want, the toppings? No. No. You'd Shouldn't be a be. jerk. <laughs> no, you're not. Well, no, no, yeah, that's right. Like, do, would they react <laughs> well to that? Right? Would they fire no, you? Would they not gonna be you? what they want. Right. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. That's not why I joined. I joined to get the pizza I want. We're just going to get it cheaper because we're doing it all together. So, right. You know, that's, we're so cooperatively that's, course, putting money in. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, and that's, and then you can go from there to like, well, okay. So how are you going to figure out the pizza topics? You're going to, you're going to have a meeting, right? And then the anchovy people all come to the meeting and now we're getting everyone anchovy pizza or 90% of the pizzas are going to be, I actually kind of like anchovy pizza. I love how we simplified yeah. this to anchovies. <laughs> yeah, no, but like, that's wrong. But that's that true. actually happens in government. Replace anchovies with something else. That's a terrible idea. You know, an ice rink in a small town in Texas is an example. I, I remember recently people are like, God, I wish we had you guys a year ago. You know, I hear that. I hear that too often, which makes me think our marketing can be dialed yeah. up a little bit. But um, yeah, no, it's that's the kind of problem you end up with. And of course, you know, meetings, no good. Online survey, we're going to do an online survey and then all the pineapple people will share it with the friends of pineapple pizza, you know, group on Facebook or whatever. Yeah. It's all garbage. And that's how you get bad data because the people most interested in the topic follow it, participate, you know, in, give input at much higher rates and share it with their friends on the same side of an issue. And so whether it's meetings or social media, any of that stuff, you just can't get good data. It'd be awesome if we could, by the way, get good data yeah. by just putting like a form out there and saying, hey, what does the community want? But you can't. So that's Doesn't why we had to create flash for to do scientific surveys. Yeah. That is uh, the best way to end this podcast. And we're almost out of time. It's exactly what you just said. That was perfect timing, by the way. Uh, oh, great. Wow. I wasn't sure how long we were going. but uh... No, it was 37 minutes and we were perfect. Uh, but man, I have so many more questions. So you and I will have to talk definitely again. get together again and talk about uh, how flash vote um, is used in communities and stuff like that a little bit more in depth. Um, but uh, this is great to get to know you, Kevin, and know more about uh, how flash vote kind of works and, and understand it. And um, I get it now. You know, it's a it's a great source for, you know, government officials that have been elected to understand what the constituents want. Right. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's data. Yeah. It's the guidance that you wish you had when you're sitting in a meeting and you have kind of a tough decision maybe, and you're getting manipulated or bullied one way. Um, do I, yeah. I can tell you a quick story if you want, but like, sure, go ahead. Have a couple minutes. 
All right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm in my town and we have this, uh, we had this cannabis issue was, was passed in Nevada. So cannabis yeah. is now legal recreational. And, uh, so I'm on, I actually was on this email list for some reason that went around town and said, Hey, we all got to go to this meeting and tell them we don't want this. Not in our town. Right. Right. And uh, so I saw this and I was like, OK, well, there's probably going to be a bunch of people at this meeting yelling at me. So sure enough, we get to the meeting. and There's five of us sitting up there and the room is packed. And one after another, I start standing up saying, this is terrible and you're awful for this and this should never happen. And no one wants this. Right. And they just build on each other. It's like social media it just kind of crowds out anyone who might be on the other side. Once you realize, you know, you're overwhelmed, you're not going to get involved. This one guy after like 30, 35 minutes, nonstop, by the way. And my, I'm going, man, this, whoa, what are we doing? You know, huh? Oh, geez, I'm getting manipulated as a data person. I know it's crap because I even saw the email. And one guy stands up and he goes, hey, you guys, uh, you remember that's like 72% of this precinct voted in favor of this, right? All the air left the room instantly. Like people just like, oh. And so all of a sudden, <laughs> No one tried to manipulate us anymore. It was over. And we were like, oh, well, wow. okay. So if we had it, where would it be? How close to the school? When would security be there? You know, would it be open at night? All these things. Wow. And and it just got practical. And all of a sudden we're tapping now into the local knowledge that's out there, not the not the mob mentality. And I was just like, mm. damn, that's what Flash Road needs to do. This is it. Bring the whole community into the room, make them representative, make them there. And then it just made, and it made you know, made the decision so much easier. I love it, man. Now it makes uh, you know a lot of sense of why you're important to government agencies throughout the country. I mean, seriously, uh, wow, we need it because it, it 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 literally is. You can get manipulated, and and these like, yeah, wow, that was a great story. I don't even know how to respond to that <laughs> one other than it, it makes not, sense. Actually, at the time. And, <laughs> it, yeah, I, I it I can like there's so many cities dealing with this every day. I can, I don't even know how they do it. Like I, I really don't at the council meetings and stuff. They can just be brutal. I've been on them many times and yeah. it's just long, it's, it's hard. And exhausting. And, and just, yeah. it's painful. It's long. It's unpleasant. It's not productive for either side, actually, when you're getting yelled at with public comments. And at the end of the day, without yeah. good data, you're either going to be lucky or wrong. And, you know, being lucky is not a strategy. And so that's, <laughs> no, that's, why, I mean, that's why you see these growing gaps in trust ultimately, unfortunately, you know, between the communities what, and their exactly. Government. And not, yeah, transparency, we need to be way more transparent than we are. And, and that's, uh, that's a whole nother probably conversation. But um, man, yeah, this well, is great if you time. want to talk about decision processes next time, that's the other part of the puzzle. So you need good data, and you need good decision processes. And, um, that's, you know, defensible data plus defensible processes equals good decisions. Let's do that. Let's do a live event on that. I think that'd be awesome. Um, you and I will set it up, uh, get some other, Sounds people, great. you know, under, yeah, that'd be awesome. So anyway, uh, Kevin, how can people get a hold of you? How can they learn more about flash vote and, um, go from there? They can, uh, besides watching your, uh, your podcasts with me, I guess, uh, no, they can find us at flashvote.com forward slash government actually takes you right to the, the good stuff. Kevin at flash vote. Okay. Um, uh, I do read my emails. And, um, you know, would love to hear from people that uh, strikes a chord with, you know, have a little passion, happy to bring flash vote to your community if it's not there already. And yeah, it. appreciate okay. your questions, by the way. Good question. Good, good in-depth. Like, I usually don't get to go to that level of, of, uh, of detail. But. Thank you for listening to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. We hope that this show brought you some insight on relevant topics within the infrastructure world. Please join us every two weeks on Tuesday for the next episode. If you're interested in being a guest on this podcast, please set up a 15-minute interview with your host at calendly.com slash chadsmeltzer. 